Tune in to Native Voices every Wednesday at 1 a.m. and Sunday at 8 p.m. for Northern California's only urban-based weekly television program focusing on the culture of Native Americans and Indigenous people of the Americas. Don't forget, we're on YouTube, we're on uh, Facebook, all of you are on Facebook, so <laughs> follow us on Facebook as we'll have pictures of the shoot, and then we'll have the show actually on YouTube. We're in quite a few different uh, cities now, and I had a list of them, but I left the list someplace else. <laughs> but we're uh, pretty much all over California, we're in Hawaii, we're in uh, a couple other states, and we're expanding every, every month or so. So we want you to keep following us and you can go to nativevoicetv.org. You can catch some of our shows that we uh, put on the website and find our contact information and anything you want to talk to us about. Good evening. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today we have with us Dr. Melinda Miko. Welcome. Thank you. And she's a professor at Mills College. And you have produced a documentary film called Killing the Seventh Generation Reproductive Abuses Against Indigenous Women. Whoa, that's pretty heavy. Yes. What's it about? It's about the forced sterilization of Native women, and um, I had taught a course on Native women at Mills, and I had a tremendous amount of material about reproductive abuses. Now, this could be anywhere from forced sterilization to um, using Depo-Provera, testing concept uh, contraceptive drugs on reservations. It's a whole gamut, and. Um, a colleague of mine asked if I had anything on it. I gave her a shopping bag full of material. Wow. She handed it back and she'd make a film. So I had a very um, energetic, still energetic, my co-producer, Esther Lucero, mm -hmm. um, was an undergrad at Mills and she came back to do a master's in public policy and said, let's do it. Let's make this film. And the research had, had shown a high percentage of women Native women and actually girls. Now there were sterilizations done in boarding school as well, for boys and girls. So wow, what? <laughs> it sounds so shocking, but it's mm -hmm. so true. Um, what period of time are we talking about? How far back until how far for, to the present? I would say to the current time, because the one of my research assistants found out in some Indian health clinics that the preferred choice of birth control with sterilization. Now, most people don't, don't actually choose permanent sterilization as a birth method, birth control method. So I think it's being um, shaded in different ways. It's being presented in different ways. But I would say the height of it was probably in the 1950s to the 1970s and 80s. And that was also massive relocation. So Native people were being moved off reservations to urban areas and became targets. And also through the Indian Health Service, they became targets for the kind of care or lack of care um, that, was, that was in Indian Health Service hospitals. Now the class you teach is American Indian Women in the U.S.? Yes. What other topics do you cover in that class? 
We cover everything from the uh, treaty, the federal trust relationship. So students actually have to understand why we have a nation to nation relationship with the federal government. So they look at the Marshall Trilogy. If you take any class of mine on Indian education or Indian history, you have to know that Marshall Trilogy. Unlike other cases like the Dred Scott case that related to African American people in 1857, that's been overturned. Mm -hmm. The Marshall Trilogy has never been overturned and it goes all the way back to the doctrine of discovery, a papal bull that Native people were savages and infidels and that it was by the right of the church to convert them. So we have embedded in our federal trust relationship this notion that we're still savage and uncivilized. Um, we also learned about sacred sites. They learn about images, particularly of Native women in film, um, certainly about forced sterilization, economic development. It's a wide range of things that, that they need to know. Um, and also, too, about the abuse of women. One out of three American Indian women will be raped in her lifetime. And that most of the violence against Native people is from outsiders or non-native to native, which is unlike other crime statistics that we know on black and black crime and white on white crime. We're the one group that stands out as one being the most violated and also from outside our, our community. Wow. And this piece is about what, 17, 18 17 minutes, minutes long. long. And you made it in what year? We made it in 2009. Um, we interviewed, um, Several people, uh, judge, she's now a tribal judge, Judge uh, Christine Williams. I was interviewed for it. One young woman, um, okay. all Native people and all Native research assistants. Let's take a look at it. Okay. All right. They felt Mary and then the moon. Yuri had the experience where a young woman came in asking about a womb transplant, that she had been sterilized and she now wanted to have children and wanted a womb transplant. What I know about forced sterilization, I've learned from first-hand accounts of my mom and my aunties. After I was born, they, uh, my mom's tubes were tied. It was like in the same procedure where I was born. They asked her if she would like, you know, to be, I guess, to be sterilized, to have her tubes tied. And she said that, yes, she would, you know. Um, I think, and looking back on it now, she said, you know, she did it because she had like a really hard birth with, with me. She had a really hard pregnancy. And so when they asked her right afterwards, she was like, you know, of course, I don't want to, I don't want to go through this again. It is labor. And it's a time when you um, bring everything in your physical being to bring forth a child. When you're at the most profound connection um, to the spirits, to um, the creator, uh, because you are creating, you're creating life, you're bringing forth life. It's probably the most vulnerable time in a woman's life. And she's thinking about this gift she's about to receive, and then a paper is shoved in her face, and often she signed this not knowing really what she signed, and then not realizing that the gift that she's just delivered is about to be taken away from her forever. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You are my 
my beloved and hated twin. But now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. One of the policies that came out of the 20th century, uh, the eugenics movement, um, which meant good breeding, uh, really was looking at who should and who should not be having children. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my home, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. Many think that it occurred as the uh, disastrous policies of the 1800s, including Sand Creek, where Colonel Shippington sought to eliminate um, all of the people at Sand Creek. And he made it very clear, along with a lot of people, what that initiative would be. And that was um, that knits make lice, and that the imperative was to not just to kill the elders, which they did, but the women and the babies and the children. So there would be no hope of any Indian remaining. I release you fear because you hold these scenes in front of me and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you. You hear about, you know, when they used to massacre villages and things like that, how they used, they used to cut out, you know, they used to cut out indigenous women's genital parts and they would put them on like their saddles and things like that. Um, they would mutilate their bodies after they were dead, you know, and, um, and that's like, you know, that's a huge assault on, on, on our reproductive rights. Even, even after we're dead, you know, you could tell that we're such a threat to them. Our being able to reproduce is such a threat to them that they have to mutilate our bodies even after we're dead. There's that come onto North, Central, and South American continents. And in order to take it, in order to steal it, they had to dehumanize us and in order to make sure that you know we didn't rise up and take it back they forcibly sterilized us i release you i release you i release you i am not afraid to be angry i am not afraid to rejoice the institutions that make up America are controlled by Euro-Americans and they definitely have a vested interest in making sure that they don't lose that control. I think that Native peoples are a reminder every day that we're alive, we're a reminder of genocide, they're a reminder of injustice. And Native people are just inconvenient to Euro-America. Um, we're inconvenient because you have things like treaty rights or you have land rights. You have all these rights that Native people have that were guaranteed from the very beginning that they don't want to uphold those rights, you know. I'm sure they're just waiting for a time when all Natives are gone so that, you know, they don't have any more responsibility for us. So I think that they have a vested interest in making sure that we don't have the right to reproduce, that, um, that they have control over who gets to reproduce. You know, like what? Really? You're taking women's reproductive parts out in a time when there are other options? How threatened can you be? I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved. These women are living. They are the living embodiment of a horrible policy that occurred. They live with it daily, and they suffer the historical trauma and the repercussions of this forced sterilization. So it's not that we're looking way back in history and trying to pull people forward. They're here, they're present, and they have not been honored. You are the shimmering young woman who found her voice when you were warned to be silent or have your body cut away from you like an elegant weed. None of the services provided for Native American people are provided as a gift or through welfare program. 
everything and nothing changes. Uh, those services were all uh, provided in, in exchange for land session and also um, rights. So Native people gave up their land, gave up their rights, and in exchange the federal government agreed that they would provide for the protection of tribes' remaining rights and of their sovereignty and of their health. Um, the health care services were designed, it seems, to um, ultimately eliminate Native people altogether. Um, Native people were left with the choice of turning to federal uh, health services, which were substandard at best um, and sometimes really maniacally designed to uh, further harm in the community, or leaving the reservation community to go out and um, get services in the general population. So it wasn't much of a choice. I heard about it in Oklahoma or New Mexico. How the wind howled and pulled everything down with a righteous anger. It was the women who told me. And we understood words, the right meaning of your murder. I do believe that Indian Health Services was used as a tool to um, continue this um, extermination of Native people and to change that 1917 statistic back to you know what it had been for the previous hundred years, um, that more Native people were dying than being born. There's many times when other groups look at Native people and think, oh, they've been the benefit of the government's wonderful policies. They've been at the receiving end of health care or um, casinos. Casinos is the, the one they really love. Look at how much money they get from casinos, but they don't want to look at the dark corners of the government's policy. They only want to look at the ones that benefit um, Native people. And they certainly don't benefit every Native person here in any way um, at all. And there's such small numbers of people who are making this. It's become uh, expanded to every Native person must receive casino money. Um, so it allows them to overlook some of these horrendous policies that occur because we are seen as the special favorites of the government. And that, in of everything, is absolutely the worst situation I think that occur. The worst misunderstanding of who we are as Native people. Would we rather have our ability to bear children, our ceremonies and our people and our land back in exchange for this? Yes. I believe we would. Justice is a story by heart in the beloved country where imagination weeps. The sacred mountains only appear to be asleep. When we finally found the room in the hall of mirrors and shut the door, I could no longer bear the beauty of scarlet with the yellow and the weeds of blackbirds. The period of forced sterilization that went on um, in Native communities um, directly links to the historic trauma and unresolved grief that we still see in those communities today. And it's really all about the various um, kind of political policies that ended up being atrocities and, and really cultural genocide toward Native people and how those um, mass, massive group trauma experiences are still impacting the Native community today. The way I think of it, it's, it's almost like a community rape. Like the whole community was violated and so there's a lot of shame and um, a lot of secrecy and people don't want to acknowledge this but if we don't acknowledge it then the pain continues, the grief continues and we pass it on to the next generation and I really do believe that you can pass um, your community grief on to the next generation and we have to stop that cycle and so I think films like this are a really key tool in reversing some of that trauma and stopping it and providing for the next generation so that, you know, this isn't gonna happen to my daughter. Horses wheel toward the morning star. Memory was always more than paper and cannot be broken by violent history or stolen by thieves of childhood. What it means is the continuation of the cycle of life. And so, you know, when you think about seven generations, that's a chunk of time. In my own family, there's a new generation born every 20 years. We kind of start young. And so, 
Um, so seven generations would be 140 years. So when you look at what's happened in 140 years in the past, we had a totally different world. The first step is acknowledging that there, there is this, you know, trauma that was created by uh, federal policy. Um, just something as simple as a federal apology would be a step in the right direction, but even that seems to be too much to ask. What do we do with an apology? I mean, an apology is one thing to actually acknowledge that it occurred, but then what do you do after the apology? How do you um, make amends, if you will? How do you push forward? Um, and part of that could be um, reparations reparations in financial terms, not that a payment could ever replace a lost generation or a lost multiple generations. Money's always good. You know, it's always good. How, how, what kind of dollar amount can you put on children that weren't born? Let's, let's have it go into reproductive women's health clinics. Uh, but that's really not enough to say, well, we stopped sterilizing Native women at a disproportionate rate, what more do you want? Um, you know, I want a lot more. Um, I want uh, to see some of the, the grief and the trauma that was created from that era addressed through mental health services, through physical health services, um, through substance abuse programs. Um, and I think all of those things are still severely, severely lacking in the Native community. We have responsibility beyond this. We have responsibility for the seventh generation because everybody does. If you look with the mind of the swirling earth and your ship rock, you become the land beautiful and understand how three crows at the edge of the highway laughing become three crows at the edge of the world laughing. a fascinating piece. Thank wow. you. Fascinating wow. and disturbing <laughs> as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. What reaction did you get from the audiences that saw this piece? Two different reactions. If we show it in a largely um, Native audience, which we've done, there, there are tears, uh, stunned silence, um, reactions where people talk about what happened to them either after giving birth and being asked, do you want to be sterilized? Um, and, or just signing forms, uh -huh. you know, go ahead, be sterilized. And then with non-Indian audiences, total disbelief. Oh, the federal government couldn't have done this. It's actually impossible. And I said, well, these are records that come from the general accounting office. We didn't make them up. And I think this is barely scratching the surface um, in what actually happened. Um, only, I think, four out of the 12 um, hospital agencies reported in for this particular report. So I feel it's still um, under documented, under counted, and as I said before, it's occurring in the present time, you know, that young Native women are going in and they're still either being directed to permanent sterilization as a form of birth control or Depo-Provera, which we know has very adverse effects on their later fertility. And it, very young girls, you know, girls are starting to use birth control at younger and younger ages. Right. So if you look at the lifetime of their reproductive life, it's shortened or it's impaired. Um, Another by these. form of extermination. Exactly. I mean, we can, we can do all kinds of extermination, and this one is clearly the one. And I, I remember during the American Indian Movement in the 1960s that it was a political act to have children uh, because it was reversing that notion of exterminating us and to have a lot of children. Um, but, of course, we need to take care of our children as part of that process. Well, I'm glad you brought this piece to us. Now, how wide of an audience has it gotten? It was first shown um, in San Francisco in 2010. 
um, at a film festival. Um, it was shown at some Indian education. It's been shown at the Intertribal Friendship House as, as part of a wellness conference in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, I will be showing it in um, Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara mm -hmm. in May. So we're trying to get it out. The, um, we really want to make the film larger and interview women who were sterilized, but my co-producer is a director at the Native American Health Center. And in order to do this, we need to have the healing circus, circles to deal with the women's trauma once they talk about it. So until we have that in place, we don't really feel it's ethical for us to interview this women with ha without having that in place. I mean, we're all Native women, right. and we really have kept it, the producers, our um, camera people, our, our interviews are all Native women. And we oh, really do wonderful. want to remain. I know there's a whole issue out there about Native men, but it sort of exceeds our topic. And then I'm hoping to move this. I've talked to some people in Canada to see how prevalent it was among First Nations to get the international, transnational mm -hmm. focus um, of these atrocities. Oh my gosh. Um, what other women's classes do you teach? Um, well, I teach indigenous uh, religion course. I'll be teaching oh. that in um, spring of 2014. And part of that is to bring our elders in from the four directions, knowing that we don't really um, do anything without our elders mm -hmm. being in consultation. Again, having the ethical relationship to any class that I, I, I teach. I teach celluloid natives, which is about American Indians in film. And um, let's see what other courses. Mainly, those are the ones that I teach that are in Indians. I often wonder. Um, you say you have mania. Uh, oops, we're almost out of time. <laughs> non Native audience, but I mean, as far as students. But what? I mean, it must be the first time they've heard yes, any of this. It is, and I think it is about disbelief. This couldn't be happening, and and all that. But it's part of education. It's hard to learn, hard to hear, but you need to know it. Well, thank you for bringing this piece to us. Thank it's you. so important for us to educate as many people as possible because, right. as we say, they're not teaching it in the schools any Well, they never have. No. no. So maybe they'll start. But uh, thank you for doing this piece, and thank you for all the work you do. Thanks thank you very much. Show. Thank you, Rose. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next Sunday night. Good night.